Hi everyone, I'm back on Thursdays today. I'll give you all a second to jump in and get a chance to grab a cuppa if you need to and sit down and uh, come chat with me. If there's any questions you have today, just pop them right up there and I'm here to answer. We have got a new member, kind of, maybe you can ask that of, look, here comes Laura. New plant that's been added to the studio. We've decided our studio needs a bit more plants. Cannot figure out the name of this plant. We're gonna find the name if anyone wants to know, but it's the prettiest thing, because Laura went out today and got a bunch of plants, including we've got one back here, to actually add to our studio space here. And so we're gradually building out our new little recording area. This is one of the three corners. Um, uh, you see the red in my hair. Ah, you spotted it. As someone says, it's a spotted begonia. I, I suspect you were definitely right. It is the prettiest plant. It's very, very pretty. Um, and hopefully because Laura has a lot more uh, knowledge about minding plants than I do, she will be in charge of keeping it alive. I am not the person to do that because I will both leave weeds thrive and leave plants die. So I should not be put in charge of any plant. Uh, Linda, what's the sweater I'm wearing? This is Bohus. Um, this was originally uh, a sweater that I had done for the Lina magazine several years ago. Uh, and the first one was in, oh, I'm going to forget. I think it's John Arben um, yarns from the UK. And this version is in Newer Sport. So it's got, uh, this is the dairy or Bare Necessities color for the main color. And then the different colors are, you can see the purple is figment. Then there's a brown copple and we've got rolling bales for the yellow going through. But it's, it's a pretty good one if you're new to color work because it's very straightforward. It's one tube going up and then these are steeped across here and the sleeves are picked up and worked down but it is, it's, it's got fairly minimal uh, color work and the steek isn't too, uh, isn't too intimidating because it's, you've got a bridge and it's a straight down in just one section. Lady Doc, no plans for you. You've a black thumb and managed to kill everyone. You and me both, um, and my husband's even worse than I am because we even almost managed to kill a whole bunch of strawberry plants in the drought because they were the size of the house we completely forgot about them. Once the strawberries were gone, nobody walked down that side of the building and those strawberry plants, only thanks to the fact that we've had effectively monsoon rains for the last week, um, I think that may possibly have revived them. I've, we've been had a very, very dry summer here. Most of Europe has. Europe and Ireland is more or less the same where it's just, it's been several months since we've had any rain of any description, even small amounts. And it has done nothing all this week except rain, which has in fact been lovely. It's such a nice variation and a slight change of pace that opening up the door and seeing the skies explode has actually been really nice. I like variety. I like variety in what I'm doing work-wise. I like variety in weather. I Yeah, variety is good. I won't go down the whole cliche route, but I do like variety um, in different things. So I wanted to ask you all the question here. We've been contemplating changing our live time. Normally we're at 2.30 every Thursday with occasional changes, but how would you all feel if we moved it to 1.30 on Thursday, just an hour earlier? If you have any thoughts on this or you think it's a good idea or not, just pop them up in the comments, let me know. Um, if it doesn't suit a lot of people, we'll reconsider if it works better for people and well and good, or it might be that it makes no difference to you one way or another. But do it'd be really, really helpful if you let us know. Um, by moving at that time, we potentially open it up for people who are in the UK and in Ireland at lunch times to be able to watch it because most people will take lunch from one to two. So it might be a good lunchtime spot, so to speak, if someone wanted to actually watch it live. Um, my concern is a little bit though of it being a bit early for people in the US, but maybe early is good so you could watch it as you're having breakfast or something along those lines. But yeah, just let me know, really appreciate it. And speaking of appreciation, thank you for all of that feedback yesterday. We had a post talking about shawls. We had a couple of different images 
and we were looking at the fact that you know the algorithm you know instagram and all that have been changing and we weren't really sure who was seeing what so we just asked anybody who was seeing the post even if they didn't necessarily have a specific comment on it to just put in a little smiley face down there so we know that you saw it and it made a very big um, it made a re it was really really a great response so thank you really appreciate it um, because sometimes when you're posting things particularly on social media um, it's hard to know who's seeing what I mean it doesn't change what we post or how we post it but it is really nice to know that the people we want to see it which is you are actually getting to see it so thank you for letting me know that um, I love the time now because it's 6 30 in Canada Joan oh my gosh that is early ah um, yeah, it's, uh, th that's the downside to different time zones and a lot of you being over there on the other side of the world. I do have, I, I won't, won't be for a few weeks, but um, I've just got a delivery from Germany of a whole pile of extra LED lights that are going to go on the ceiling here. A new upgrade to video camera and lens and I'm afraid to open the box because I'm a little intimidated. Uh, anyone who's kind of got a new tech like that, particularly something that I have to learn a lot for and hopefully get somebody in to teach me and help me figure out how to do it. So I'm both very excited and very intimidated because it's going to take a bit of work to learn how to use it properly. But I do have high hopes in terms of really being able to upgrade video quality um, for tutorials and things like that. I think it's going to make a really big difference like I've been using primarily my iPhone for most things which works very well but anyone who uses an iPhone you have to go really close to the table when you're working on something in order to be able to um, see it properly which does mean that I'm kind of cramped with working it but having a proper camera you're going to have a, a different focal length so you can actually pull the camera a good bit further away and still see it really well which is going to be a huge bonus and I think it'll really free me up to be able to use the full table and move around more naturally with my knitting rather than you should see me sometimes when I'm sitting there on my tutorials because I've got a camera up here the camera leg is in front or the tripod leg is in front and I'm sitting like this to try and make sure that you can see what I'm doing clearly but it is not exactly what I would call a natural knitting style all the time it's more about a knitting style that will allow people to see what I'm doing on the camera that's sitting over my shoulder here. So yes, fingers crossed. I will start posting some stuff up as I do some test runs and we can see how it's going. And if you notice a difference in the quality um, and if it's worth this crazy investment in all this video equipment, fingers crossed it is. I really do hope so. Um, kind of tied with the post we were looking at yesterday um, we were talking about shawls and we were asking people your favorite shawls and people were saying what they liked what they disliked and a lot of people were kind of saying oh I love this but it looks like it might be too complicated and if you're a little worried about something being outside either outside of your comfort zone or potentially outside of your skill zone that is one that I would suggest you make sure to find um, at one that has got a workshop class with because that way you can use it as an opportunity to learn to learn because you know that the shawl is something that you want to knit or that you'd like to wear so by kind of using that as a starting point it'll kind of spur you on to work your way through the class so that you get your finished um, you get the finished piece out that you want at the end of it so that's the that's that's the idea behind the workshops and so if like most shawls, particularly the more recent ones, will all have workshops associated with it. But um, you need to just double check because there are some of the older ones that wouldn't necessarily have that. But I thought I would talk through a couple of the shawls that we had yesterday and a few ones that we weren't showing you. And so some of the uh, shawl will show some of the yarns that we use with them. And maybe I'll learn how to talk again. Um, I do also in a minute want to show uh, something I'm working on with you but that's for later. Um, you learn so many different stitches and techniques by knitting shawl, a fun learning experience. You're absolutely right because shawls, the advantage of them is they don't have to be exactly the right size. Now the thing you need to be careful of is if you've got a very different gauge you may not have enough yarn but if you have extra yarn 
and if the shawl is a little bit bigger or a little bit smaller you're not too worried then it takes one big worry factor away plus you can kind of make mistakes in a shawl and in all likelihood you can probably build them into the actual shawl itself because they're just they come in many shapes and sizes i had somebody who was doing a mystery shawl knit along several years ago before i was doing videos and she thought she was following the instructions but she had like taken a big chunk and misinterpreted the the idea so with the result that the shawl shape which was biased going like this and getting wider she had flipped the right and wrong side every time she was starting so she actually created a zigzag shawl it was the most interesting thing i've ever seen and she loved it but i mean it was just an example of how you can create something totally different when you're knitting shawls and it still works because it's still a shawl you know it may be more like an extended scarf but it can still be worn and it still performs a function so i'm going to go and show one of the shawls from last year that i really love it was there was two versions of this this is the red shawl this is the canuck shawl um, and the two versions are because this one had just a panel of textured stitches here and the second one had um, textured stitches worked all the way across here so there was no stockinette stitch panel on the other one they're both part of the same pattern um, and they're done in gilet yarn this was from the winter seasons club last year um, and it started with a tip here and just working out with increases and then once you reach this point it turns into stockinette stitch um, but with this shawl i think the reason i like it is you can throw it over your shoulders like this and because it's a worsted weight it's nice and cozy and it's quite warm but you can bunch it up i'm going to probably muffle this over here too and it becomes here let's uncover that more of a glorified scarf um, to be able to tuck in um, and i do like having the option of t of both of those because if I'm sitting around and my shoulders are cold, having something with a bit more width means that I can use it as something to keep me warm or like a pseudo cardigan. But if you're out and about, it's your neck you want warm. So being able to bunch it up really helps. So this particular one uses gilet. And here is one of the gilet we have in stock. This one is the gray. And it's an organic merino wool from France. And the really interesting thing about the way this is spun is normally when I'm talking about it with spinning, it's either worsted or woolen spun. With woolen spun being that it traps a lot of the air in it and it's, it's kind of light, but it's not going to be quite as smooth. Worsted spun, very smooth, but a little bit denser and heavier. This is somewhere between the two. It's got quite a lot of the lightness of woolen spun, but when you actually take a look at the yarn itself, it is smoother than most woolen spuns so it's it kind of it sits somewhere between the two i would be very curious to actually go visit the mill to see exactly how that happens because i know what they said it turns out like i don't know how that happens on the back end but it is a very pleasant yarn to work with and it's just it's got a lovely hand it's light it's comfortable and the finished product is very comfortable to wear and just the stitches fill out really nicely when you're working, when you, after you block them um, and, and they just show the texture really well. So this is on the website or you can get kits or just actually go get the workshop or the pattern if you've got a yarn that works for you at home. So this one, that's the Canuck shawl and the Gillet yarn. So the second one, uh, here we go. This is the ultimate in learning shawls because it was actually designed as a brioche workshop. So this is Vines and Veil. It is not a huge shawl because it just uses 100 grams or two skeins of each of the colors in newest sport but it was originally for um gosh it's probably more years than i want to talk about now but several years ago we did a retreat here in cork and we were talking about brioche knitting and so i wanted something that took people who knew just the most basic of brioche stitches and then slowly worked their way through the shawl where the shawl got bigger so they could practice the stitch and slowly introduce different concepts into it. So with this one, it starts just at the tip here with two color brioche. 
But what you've got going on one side, you've got an increase all the way along, and on the other side, you have a decrease. There's more increases than decreases, so it gets wider as you work along. So that's what you're doing for the first section to here. Then when you get there, you start introducing a very small little panel at the side. Um, I'm going to call it lace, but it's not really. It's more, it's more texture. Uh, I mean, it's increases and decreases, but it's not lacy as such. And that is just at the side. And that stays the same all the way along. So as you go across, anything that's not worked in that stays in the two-color brioche. And that just stays going all the way across. And then at the very end, when you kind of got to grip with it, you know what you're doing, you can go and introduce the full amount of repeats all the way across. So it's the same, it's the same pattern that you've been doing, but now it's across the full row rather than just one section. And then you've got a bind off. So this to me is actually for learning brioche, two color brioche, increases, decreases, it's just a very good way of practicing because you it's you introduce each of those and then you repeat them a lot as you're going through so you get a very very good chance of getting them to stick or solidifying them in your head because with most things it is repetition is what is going to get them to, to stick you know doing it once going yes I know what to do from walking away but not actually coming back and doing it again and doing it again um, it's not going to be there when you come back the next time. So a shawl where you've got quite a bit of the same stitch, I think is extremely uh, helpful for getting it to stick into your head. So the yarns I used in that are my newest sport. Got a bunch of colors here. So these are the two original ones. That was Kitten Fluff, which is the gray, and Figment is the purple. And you can see, like with brioche, if you've got a nice, I suppose sharp, big, big contrast between the two colors, you're going to get, um, it's going to be easier to do as you're working and it'll kind of really jump out at you. You can, of course, I'm kind of pulling up a few other ones. You could have, you can quite go quite bright in your contrasts and it's going to actually work. I'm trying to look at ones that would kind of be interesting here. Like the ones that I, I think, for instance, these two together could make a really interesting shawl as well. Like you put them together and you're like, oh, I'm not sure. But as soon as you start knitting them up in a shawl pattern, particularly in brioche, because it's striped one on top of each other, um, the interaction changes the way they look. And oh, let me pull this up. You probably know this already, but it's one of the cool things about two color brioche. One side, it looks predominantly gray with kind of the purple in the background. Of course, you flip it around and it's the opposite. It's more purple with the gray receding to the back. So it's kind of like getting two for the price of one when you got a two-color brioche shawl. You can flip it back and forth depending on what you want. You can go for something with slightly less contrast between the two colors. But if you're a newer brioche knitter, it's going to make it um, a little bit trickier to learn. If you're experienced and you know what you're doing, it creates a lovely effect, very subtle uh, and tonal. But for learning, bigger contrast makes it easier because it's a little bit like having each side color coded then because there's an obvious dark and a light. And so you can really see what you're doing very clearly, which when you learn is always good. So that's next one for learning. Um, I'm going to go on to another couple here that were also originally knit alongs for the last couple of years, which means they actually do have workshops um, set up. This one was from last year. You may remember this. This is the quilted feather. And this ended up being much more popular than I'd anticipated because with mysteries, you don't know whether people are going to be into it or not or what the general what the general consensus will be but this one people really really enjoyed and part of it which is often the ones I find are things that people think are beyond them and then as with a knitted long a knit along as you're working through it because you're just dealing with that one section and you're tackling that you're not looking at the big picture you're just looking at that one clue and when you can do that, you're like, OK, I know what I'm doing. And then the next one builds on that. And so you can take on a little bit more each time. And it somehow seems much more manageable. I, I mean, the best um, response I got from someone, they said that if they saw a photograph of the quilted feather in completed before they started the mystery knit along, they would not have joined because they would have thought it was beyond them. 
but they finished it and they had a beautiful quilted feather. So to me, it's a really, really good example of never selling yourself short or think you can't do something. Just take it in bite-sized chunks and you will get there. Um, and mystery knit alongs help with that. Or just if you're doing workshops, just take one chunk at a time. Don't worry about the big part because it may be overwhelming if there's a lot of new things on it. So just have the bite-sized pieces and tackle each one at a time. This one is top down. So it is really bite-sized when you start because you're literally starting with just a few stitches and circular increases. And then you come on here to a slip stitch quilted feather. This one, it uses a fluffy mohair blend. There was a couple of different ones. This one was the mohair. It was, let me see, Caprito. I'm not sure there's Caprito here. I do have a similar one here. What is the Sensei? You can see this is a kind of a mohair blend here. This is mohair and silk. Uh, very light, but it's just used kind of as a contrast working through like this. Then it moves into a much bigger section. And then the final one, you're knitting from side to side with a um, just the stitch pattern all the way along. And this one is kind of a crazy stitch pattern because it's like it's got these extended cables where you're doing wrapping the yarn several times and then dropping them when you do the cable cross. Um, what yarn did I use for this? There was two different ones. It was Manos to Uruguay Fino, um, which I, oh, here we go. I missed it entirely. These are the two here. This is the Manos to Uruguay and it's a Fino, super, super soft. And this is the Caprito. And this one is Admiral, I think is this color. And the color of this one is Butternut. So that was the color of the shawl I just showed you. Um, and this is, it's single ply and just super soft. Um, and the same with this one. So these are ones where when you're working this particular shawl, it's also a bit like the one I was talking about a while ago. Uh, very, very important to have um, sharp contrast because you want the two stitches when you do the slip stitch to really stand out against each other. So that was a quilt of feather from last year. And I've got another one here, which was the year before, and this is Kush Farragut. Um, this, I think, is probably um, probably an easier shawl um, overall. Um, let me pull it back so you can see the full thing. The fun part about this was that there was two directions. Same stitch pattern, but just colors reversed and worked in another direction. So this one started down here with the tip and you're increasing along doing stripes into colors and in slip stitches. Um, and with this as well, you could, if you wanted to, even play around with different things. Like if you had, um, like say, one that was a variegated yarn that was going through different colors or you had bits of other colors running through, you could actually even have, if you had a small bit of different colors in the same weight, you could even start working through the stripes as you went through in different colors once you had a single color in the background to hold the whole thing together. And then once you've finished with that and all those stitches are live, you start the second triangle from the bottom, like from the very bottom there, and you work your way up, incorporating a stitch each time as you go and increasing at the other side. You eventually end up with a big triangular shawl and just you've got like an I-cord edging along the top here. And there was, if I remember correctly, it's a Pico edging on the top of this. Because this was originally a knit along, we do have a full set of workshops for this one. So sometimes when there's unusual things like joining one to another, and if you have a hard time picturing it, with the workshop, you've got a visual in front of you so you can actually see how the whole thing fits together. This original was done in Blasta Light. Got a couple of the colors here. So this is um, it, this is my Blasta Light yarn, which is 60% Irish fleece, and it's spun for us in Donegal, and it's single ply, so it's very it's very light, and it's got kind of a slight thick and thin quality going through it, and because it's woolen spun, it does bloom up really nicely when it's washed, and it is light as air. Like when you are wearing that shawl, it's extremely warm, but it's very very light. So it's. Um, it is going to be, because the, the Irish fleece, it's um, not going to be as soft as merino, but it does get softer with each wash. But the airiness, you kind of can't beat. This is a new color we've had in Blast Delight, which I think that shawl would be lovely. And this is an Adour. And the original one here had emerald, which is a bright green, and Farragut. Um, Farragut is the Irish for sea. 
and it is if you can kind of see that it may it's not going to be the seas you will see in the mediterranean or in any of the warmer countries but if you are used to irish seas in winter set time that is to me very true to the irish sea color it's got like purples and deep blues and greens and it's that's the color of the irish winter sea so farragut is where that comes from there's a few other colors here which are also this is leah which is our gray and this one is brack which is it's a kind of a blue a kind of a rich blue with kind of tones of purple in it it's probably the best way to put it and if you want something a little brighter this is or the irish for gold so there are some of the lost and light colors um, there was one more shawl we don't have a workshop for it um, but well there are a few more but i'll be here all day i can show you some more next week if there's any more shawls you want to see this is our half moon shawl and this was one it was a, the original was in a fingering weight and when i did the edinburgh yarn festival many years ago i had a sample of it up on the wall and i was just selling patterns and books at the time and everyone kept asking can i get the yarn for that can i get the yarn for that and i was only selling the pattern and a lot of people were disappointed but the year after I started doing Nuba yarn, it was a heavier sports weight yarn. So I designed a second version of the shawl in Nuba Sport. So this is the sports weight. So the next year I was able to go back with yarn kits for people. But when you buy it, you get two shawl patterns. Basically, you'll get the fingering weight shawl pattern and you will get the sports weight shawl pattern. So it's from the top down just like occasional pearl rows and then you've got you're working from kind of a light to dark color in the background and then you've got these string of pearl patterns as you go through where each of these you just work back and forth as you get to them to work those well they're called string of pearls but it adds a really interesting feature let me pull this down and it finishes off with a pico edge in that same color that you used for the string of pearls so Again, this is, and let me pull this over my shoulders, super generously sized shawl. So you can kind of see it comes all the way down here. So if you like big shawls and ones that you can wrap all the way over your shoulders or tuck around your neck, it's a very good one for you. So this is the half moon shawl. So that's kind of a few of the shawls. If there's a few that I know I haven't touched on all my shawls, if there's a few more you'd like to see or a little bit more detail, just pop them up and we can chat about them next week. Um, I've got, oh, those two things I want to talk to you about. First one is obviously last week we launched Seasons. This time around we we're keeping Seasons open for a really short period of time. So it's only going to be open till next week. So if you're thinking about joining us, jump in sooner rather than later because it will be closed. Um, but the other thing I wanted to talk about is what I've been working on. Um, posted this up on um, Instagram a couple of days ago and it is a brioche sweater kind of a shorter sweater um, slightly oversized but it's going to have set in sleeves so I've got just decreases are kind of all part of the pattern here and here are the neck decreases and I'm loving all this I have just started on the sleeves and I'm sitting and I'm trying to figure out how to work it because of course normally I do my sleeves top down and set in where I do short rows back and forth but the problem with brioche, of course, is that, first of all, you don't have as many stitches because of the fact that it, it's quite wide relative to the length, but you have a lot of rows. And what that's going to mean is I'm not going to have enough rows to create a short row shoulder in the same way that I normally do. And combined with that, when I do short rows with brioche, I usually like to turn at the end of every um, brioche knit stitch because I find that it gives me a better result and I'm not going to make a mess that way. So with short row shoulders, typically you would turn every stitch. So I kind of started last night and suddenly realized that it's not going to work in the usual way. So I've just been kind of trying to brainstorm, come up with different ways of doing it. First one obviously is I could just do it from the bottom up and sew it in. Um, it's totally possible. Never my favorite way of doing it, but if all else fails, I will go down that route. The other thing that I might give a shot at this weekend is the possibility of doing short row wedges. So just doing the short rows the way I usually do, but every two stitches turning. 
which is going to create just a very small shoulder but then doing one round to get all the way around again and going and doing a second wedge and doing several of those possibly one on top of each other I don't know if it's going to work so I'm going to try it out and if it does work I will come back and let you know this weekend this is both what I hate and love about knitwear design particularly if I'm trying something or combining a technique like brioche with um, a yarn or, or a pattern that I haven't done before because I will just kind of chug along in the way that I've usually done things until I hit a point where I know it's not going to work anymore so I have to effectively dream up a new way of doing it and figure out if it's going to work so that's where I'm at now and I both love and hate it because I love it because this is the exciting part I don't know if it's going to work and it makes it exciting because I'm going to sit through and see if it will uh, stressful because if it doesn't work I have to try something else and it could take much longer than I expect it to take so basically I'm going to keep on going with this and if it works great otherwise I'll have to start over again but I will know by the end of this weekend whether or not it works so fingers crossed for me that all works well um, I missed one question up there you're asking how do I store my shawls um, generally speaking with shawls I've got like, if there's something in regular use I'll probably have it actually hanging on my coat stand with my uh, with my coat uh, is where the most really frequent used ones are otherwise like a lot of them end up living in the studio in which case they're just going to be stacked um, up along here they don't need as much care usually as sweaters because they don't get as dirty and they're taken off if you're going to be eating or in those kind of situations so they don't need as much washing I do find sometimes some of them particularly if it's lace or if there was circular increases may possibly be in need of a bit more blocking um, so in those cases if it needs washing I'll wash it and reblock. other times I might just pin it out and steam it to kind of get the shape back in where I want but in terms of storage I, it's generally yeah hanging in the coat stand or kind of stacked on shelves in the shop or at home would pretty much be it um, I think I've probably come to the end of my live today um, I will as always uh, save this pop it up on the grid so if you want to see it again later or if you're just jumping in at the end and you're cur curious what we talked about you'll have it all up here so thank you for joining me again I will see you next week if we end up changing the time we'll make sure to post it up so you will know about it um, and otherwise just please just jump in and let me know if you would like the time changed or if you don't really care one way or another that's useful information as well all right bye everyone thank you